Um, so welcome to the Leeds Virtual LGBT Plus Literature Festival. Um, we are doing an interview with Justin Myers. My name's Ed, um, he, him, and I am the treasurer for Leeds LGBT um, Plus Book Club and one of the organisers for the Lit Fest. Um, yeah, so welcome, Justin. Thank you very much. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Justin Myers. I'm also known as the Guy Liner uh, for really boring reasons. Uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I am an author now, and I've written two books, uh, The Last Romeo and The Magnificent Sons, both of which have a heavy LGBTQ plus flavour. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here because obviously I was supposed to be a guest last year in person, and then like some big thing happened. So here we are a year later doing it over Zoom, but better than nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I know you're originally from Shipley, aren't you, which isn't too far away from Leeds. I am, yeah. I grew up, uh, born and grew up, I'm born in Bradford, um, but I grew up in Shipley and left when I was 18. My mum still lives in Shipley, so I'm still up, uh, up north a lot. Yeah, lovely. Um, yeah, so um, we're, we'll touch on your first book, your debut novel, a little bit, and then we'll mainly speak about um, your second one, The Magnificent Sun. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, so with um, your first novel, The Last Romeo, um, it is a book I really enjoyed reading. I think it's very relatable. Um, so it's um, the main character, isn't it, James? He's sort of yes. doing his search for the next Romeo, one more Romeo. And um, it's the story of how he, how he sort of goes through that search really. And um, at times sort of takes on a persona and um, yeah, he's doing a blog as well, isn't he? In the yeah, so he's a, uh, he is, it was semi very, very, very lightly autobiographical in that it's a guy called James who breaks up with his boyfriend and starts an anonymous dating blog, just going on dates with different guys and then writing about them afterwards um, without their knowledge, obviously. And he does, after a while, start to kind of lean into his persona, maybe a little bit too much and enjoy the notoriety and fame because he becomes really popular and uh, it goes to his head and other parts of his body. Um, yeah, so, so that, was my, that was my first one. Yeah, The Last Romeo. Yeah, um, yeah, I think it's really relatable. I think like there's not many books that focus so heavily on like online dating and how, how it all happens now. Um, yeah, no, the, strange really, because online dating has been around for quite a while now, especially, you know, for, for gay men with, with Grindr and everything. Grindr's over 10 years old now. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there have been maybe novels about it, but I just hadn't seen any. Um, so it was really interesting to bring that whole world that's such a huge part of uh, the LGBTQ experience uh, to life in the novel, I suppose, and everything that can go wrong and go right alongside it. Yeah, yeah, it's a really nice read. It's a fun, fun read as well at times. At times, yes, not, not all. It's not, no. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I quite like the idea of people finding my books light, but I don't think it's light all the time there are you know there are serious moments darker moments i suppose which which maybe made it a bit more realistic yeah i hope so one question i was going to ask you is because you've written a lot for publications as well on dating haven't you mm, yeah um so I, like um do you get asked a lot for for dating advice i do i do get asked a lot um and i don't know why because if anyone who had read you know, the blog that I did as the guy liner for all those years would know that I wasn't very good at dating at all. I was quite, um, well, I ended up going on about a hundred dates. So obviously good at going on dates, but not good at hanging on to, you know, the men I went on dates with, but I do, even now I still get asked for, I mean, I was advice columnist in gay times for about five years. So I still, and I'm do sex and relationship stuff for GQ now. So I still, yeah, I do get asked a lot for dating advice. And um, people tend to be disappointed with my advice because generally it's, God, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. But um, I do I do quite like um, being that, I suppose it appeals to my vanity, being that kind of sage, dispensing my words of wisdom to friends or, or people I meet because it makes me feel a bit useful, I suppose. 
Yeah. I think in the first novel, we do see sort of, um, you sort of see like the nastier side of dating apps as well, don't you? Sort of mm. a bit of discrimination and um, what people sort of try and hide maybe so much. Like when it comes, I think a lot of dating apps are aimed at probably like younger generations, some, you know, some are more aimed at towards that. There's a bit of a, some, a bit of a thing about sort of maybe reducing your age a bit. On the... Yeah, I mean, James is quite lucky in in the, the 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 hierarchy of privilege, I suppose, in that he's a white guy, he's in his early thirties. So you know, he there are people in a, who are much more marginalised than he is, and I suppose the apps can be they're still a bit like the Wild West, aren't they? They're like a, you know, they rely on a lot of self regulation and moderation, and often they fail in that regard. Mm -hmm. And it's I suppose it's like a lot of technology what they give they also take take something away but they have brought together you know marginalized people like like nothing else it's kind of revolutionized you know the lgbtq sexual experience hasn't it it's you know it's allowed us to search for like-minded people and do away you know people who aren't that confident maybe about chatting people up in bars which was the old way of doing it or don't want to go to saunas or do the the other you know, more traditional, less safe ways of organizing a hookup or whatever like that. It's, it's, it's given us a lot, but there is the, you know, the meanness, it's emboldened a lot of people to be cruel, I think, because it's from behind a screen and it's, maybe people don't think about other people's feelings quite as much as they might if a person was actually standing in front of them. But overall, I do think apps and dating websites or whatever are a force for good. It's human nature that turns out to be the problem usually. Yeah, no, that's very true. Very true. Um, so have there been any um, interest in the film rights then for The Last Room? Yeah. It's in development for TV at the moment. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm not allowed to say anything, but it is. It's being developed. Yeah, it's exciting. It's an exciting stage, but I'm not allowed to say anything else. I don't think, probably. I don't know why. But that, that's just what they tell you to say. That you're not allowed to say anything. That's okay. No, I don't that's... know anything. <laughs> yeah. Just that. <laughs> Lovely. That's really good um, to hear. Um, yeah. Okay. So we'll move on to your second novel. Um, so yes. the Magnificent Sons. So is it published in 2020? It was the the year of hell. It yeah. was what an amazing time to bring a book out. But I suppose people had worse problems going on. So I can't really moan too much. Yeah, it came out on hardback uh, in 2020 and then paperback, which is this cover over my shoulder, uh, in April, about a month ago. Wow. Um, so what were your like motivations for writing the story behind um, The Magnificent Sons? Well, it was contractual. I had to write another one. Uh, I'd signed to say that I would. Um, I suppose I could have gone anywhere with book two. And I think my publishers were probably expecting um, a romantic comedy, but I felt that I kind of had something else to say, really. I, I'm really fascinated by this world that we inhibit as LGBTQ people and how we navigate the parts of the world that try to exclude us or make us uncomfortable. And you know, I'm, I'm impressed by how adaptable we are and we've had to be. And I really wanted to write a book about what it might be like trying to deal with all these things. If you were coming out now in, well, now it's 2021, um, and maybe as one of the more overlooked stripes of the LGBTQ rainbow, because the main character is uh, bisexual, um, I, so what drove me to write it was, I suppose, I feel, I just find it really fascinating the way all these different tribes of our umbrella rub along together and these kind of hierarchies that we invent and the, the battles we have and the alliances we form within them. You know, it's ever expanding and we're adapting all the time. We're like in, in a state of constant evolution. So I wanted to kind of take a snapshot of what the world looks like now and what that might look like now. Uh, and see how an LGBTQ person, or the different actually LGBTQ experiences that someone might have now, because there's you know, a lot of different uh, realities happening at the same time, depending on how old you are, what kind of relationship you're in, uh, what your sexuality is, your gender, that kind of thing. Yeah, 
And it follows two brothers, doesn't it, in a way, um, Jake and Trick? Yeah, so there's uh, two brothers, they're 12 years apart in age, which is another thing I wanted to explore as well, um, intergenerational conflict, which does my head in, you know, the the prejudices we have um, regarding age, and you know, it's an, on such a random thing, like when somebody was born. So it's two brothers, 12 years apart in age. Um, one, the younger brother, Trick, is a very outwardly confident, um, uh, boisterous, uh, showy, gay young man. Um, and his older brother, Jake, is a repressed, um, emotionally stunted, quiet and reserved man who is realising that his uh, homosexual experiences when he was younger weren't just a phase or a little thing that he tried his you know his feelings that he's had he's he's actually bisexual and so it's about him exploring that yeah I, I found it really interesting to sort of see their different experiences through the mm. book yeah because experiences can be so different can't they even you know I came out quite late I was 24 25 when I came out and you know it, the my my experience was so different from someone who was my age and yet had come out at 16 for example like completely different I was a completely different person and had different baggage that I was bringing along with me and my own crap to deal with you know so it's it's quite a leveling experience I think coming out and whatever age you are mm. so um I read in the book I don't know if it was in the the afterward bit um you mentioned um Joan Collins uh, Dame Joan Collins had read the book um so other than Joan, Dame Joan Collins and like LGBT plus lit fest followers who would you want to read this book or did you have any audience in mind when you sort of um were uh, crafting the story obviously jo Joan Collins is number one for anything I write obviously um no I don't really have an audience in mind when I'm writing um, you know, I read reviews of my books or other books with like gay or bi or lesbian or trans characters. And I see over and over again, like the same thing. Oh, even though I'm not the target audience for this book, I really liked it. And that's terrific to be reaching more people. But who said you're not the target audience? I don't understand that. Why, why do you feel like that? You know, do potential murderers only read crime novels? You know, there's so many books about posh people living in the 1920s. Are they only for posh people who are living in the 1920s? Because if they are, that readership is running out very fast. You know, I, I've never understood why books about sexuality are deemed to be only for us. I mean, it's important for us, obviously, to see ourselves represented in the media, but often we kind of know how the story goes because we've lived it. We're not really usually the person who needs to be reading it, to be having that window or that wake up call into another world. You know, occasionally a book about, you know, a, a gay person or a trans person will break through into the mainstream. But sometimes there's that feeling of, oh, we've had that book now. So we'll see you in another, in another five years for the next one. And then we'll just go back to the books that we've always been reading and that we've always been, you know, um, talking about. We will just wait for the next phenomenon. Um, you know, my favourite books are about diverse groups of people, all vastly different from one another. Um, I understand people who like to stick to their genre, but there's still wiggle room within those for, for different kinds of people. So, so no, I don't. I, I, obviously, I have a core audience and I, and I talk to them online a lot but I think if I sat there and and wrote with a very calculated idea about who the book was for it would take me longer and it wouldn't be a very interesting story because I'd be I'd be worried about satisfying everybody along the way so I just have to write it and hope that it sticks like throwing spaghetti at the ceiling to check it's ready yeah um yeah, touching on sort of diversity there, I really liked like how you included a, a transgender character. Um, it's Kia. In, in Kia, the, yeah. Yeah. Um, how did you find writing a, a young transgender person? Well, I think she is young. She's, uh, she's 17 at the start of the book. And I was nervous about writing young people full stop, to be honest, because I'm, I'm 45. So... Uh, writing Trick and his friends who are all 17, 18 was terrifying, but I do have a seven, I, my godson was 17 at the time. So any language howlers, I would run past him. I avoided using slang or anything like that because 
you know, it's, it's, it would date the book re really heavily anyway. But as for writing Kia, I suppose I was nervous um, because I'm not trans, obviously, and I wanted it to be as an authentic telling of, as possible of a trans story. I mean, she's not a main character, but she's an important one. But, you know, I'm quite observant and I'm online a lot and I speak to trans and non-binary people and I read their work and um, I wanted to portray her sensitively and show, you know, Kia's not just there to make up numbers. She's not just there because, oh, let's have someone from the, the trans, uh, you know, group of people in there just for the sake of it. She's there. She plays a significant role in showing the different levels of maturity, like I was talking about you know, that, that they don't necessarily correspond to age. Um, you know, she's already, she's only 17 at the start of the book, but she's already been through more than most of the other, other characters can even imagine. So it was, yeah, I was very conscious of not just making her a token character who didn't have anything to say. She plays a really important role, I think, in making Jake and Trick, um, be thankful for the privilege they have. And she's good at pointing out their bull on that score as well, I think. Definitely, yeah. I really like her as a character and I'm happy with how she turned out. And feedback tells me I did okay. But we'll see, there's still obviously much more feedback yet to come. And um, are you wanting to do a reading from the book? Oh! You don't want to do that? No, I can if you want. Trick's kind of the most fun to read, I think. Mm -hmm. Because he's so awful. So maybe I'll do him. Trick knew he was gay before he even knew what being gay actually was. He always felt different from the children in nursery. They were all so loud and rambunctious, but there was no grace in what they did, no flair. It was so terribly dull. Trick didn't want to run around the playground shouting, holding a truck or screaming while chasing boys who wanted anyone but you to catch them. He wanted to perform, to be seen. Patrick has a wonderful flamboyant energy, was his first teacher's view on parents' evening, while Trick waited outside the classroom, practicing his catwalk strut, three copies of the children's illustrated encyclopedia balanced upon his head. Trick always knew there had to be more then what? He didn't know, but he did know whatever was waiting out there for him would never be enough. His enthusiasm did dip toward the end of primary school, and in a panic that the one child who actually seemed to, be, seemed to enjoy being there was flagging, his teachers put him in another class, which was where he met Kia and Hot Will, then just plain old William, of course, but not for long. He realised then that amazing theatrical people did exist, People just like him, who understood that the world was a stage, a performance, and you had to give 110%, even when the spotlight was otherwise engaged. And then, as puberty took up residence, and after a succession of dreams about the guy who sat next to him in double science, Trick finally put a label on it. Gay, but not just for the sex, gay for everything, life, music, fashion, friends, gay plus, he liked to call it. Platinum card-holding rejectors of heterosexuality and all its dull trappings, like corduroy or leaving the house with no eyeliner on. His brother Jake, in other words. Jake never even tried. The Christmas before, Trick had worn his customised jumper adorned with body parts of Barbie and Ken dolls acting like baubles on a huge glittery Christmas tree. Yes, he had been boiling hot in it, but as he always told his followers, we must suffer for art. Trick knew that this sartorial expression annoyed his brother, dazzling as ever in his pristine uniform of Oxford shirt and chinos in the perfect shade of migraine. Trick had taken to calling Jake a clean shirt behind his back, and he watched in delight as Jake spilled gravy all down his front, face wrinkling in displeasure. As Jake was mopping it up with mum's second best napkins, he asked Trick about his unusual wardrobe. You were uh, making a statement or something? Just wondered. No offence. God! He was so tiresome. His entire conversational repertoire, the kind of questions you'd ask one another at a speed dating night. No offence, indeed, like Jake could ever be controversial enough to offend anyone. Trick looked round the room, 
Mom was in her spangly party sweater, so bright that if she stood in the garden, planes would mistake her for Heathrow. Dad had his garish Christmas sweater vest on, and Sister Margot was upright and uncomfortable in a sleek cocktail gown, even though she wouldn't be leaving the house. It's how we roll, Jake. You should try making a statement sometime, other than a bank statement. Jake saw, had smiled thinly and said one of his dreary conversation destroyers, like, fair enough, or have it your way, all potential for debate successfully vaccinated against. He just had no bite. Given how much Jake sought to be in their company, you'd think Jake would be glad to be nothing like them. Mum and Dad always seemed extra edgy when Jake was around. Mum did this fake giggle after literally everything Jake said and looked at him like he was a big pie that she couldn't wait to eat. A personality only a mother could love, trick guest. Dad, too, was a traitor. All bear hugs and clinking beer cans. Lads, lads, lads. Pathetic. All that effort and creeping around just to make sure that Jake was comfortable and for no result, because Jake would just stand there limply, like he'd rather be anywhere else, back in his boring, minimalist, open prison of a flat, watching documentaries and bookmarking articles about climate emergency on his iPad. The atmosphere lightened the second the door closed behind him, and sometimes Trick wished they could just get the locks changed. There we go. Thank you. So just to point out that Trick is a 17-year-old and very much wrapped up in his own world, which is why he's quite a lot. Yeah, he's quite, I, quite, I know he had, he had his tantrums, but I quite liked him as a character. Oh, so did I, definitely, definitely. He's quite divisive, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was going to ask you as well. Um, I know it's something you've written on, um, like own voices, um, which we mm -hmm. took on earlier, um, um, and the current debate surrounding sort of own voices in films and literature. Um, yeah, um, so what are your feelings about media sort of um, having own voices? Um, I think it's important. I think it's creatively enriching i mean obviously there is room for imagination and creativity uh but it, i mean it does add an authenticity i think not just to the story but for the reader i think a reader reading an lgbtq story by an lgbtq plus author will probably feel a bit safer they will feel that maybe their interests are going to be looked after at least slightly better than they might be under a straight author. I mean, obviously there's gonna be some clangers in there. You know, it's like casting, uh, you know, TV shows, like, it's, like you say, I've spoken about before, like Russell T Davies said that he wanted to make sure that all the characters in It's the Sin, uh, his recent drama, were true to the sexuality they portrayed on, on TV. And I think it, it does add to the experience. If the actor is gay, you know, you, you want it for the actor as well, you want, a gay actor, for example, a gay actor, uh, to thrive, but you want it for yourself too, um, especially with there being such a scarcity of not just roles, but uh, LGBTQ characters on screen. Um, and I think it also makes straight people confront their own prejudices. Because to be honest, I can't really get excited about a gay soap storyline that's claiming to be groundbreaking or resonating with viewers if it's straight actors cosplaying it with their really chaste kisses. Um, not that it's their fault, they've been cast to do a job. And I must say, lots of straight actors play uh, gay characters brilliantly and, and have done. But, you know, it, it adds something, I think, to it. So um, it's important for me as a gay man to write about characters that aren't just like me, but that live in the world that I live in. I think what's interesting about it is that when you are writing about LGBTQ experiences, there is more of a pressure on you, I think, to be representative and to get it right and to reach as many corners of the LGBTQ plus world as you can. And it's not always possible. And when you aim that high, you, you can be setting yourself up for failure. But I think it's because there is such a paucity of representation that we we really look we look for it and when we find it we you know examine it forensically and we really we, we judge it and that's something I think we are right to do 
but uh, but sometimes at times it can be a bit like oh god this is I wonder who is going to be reading this and what are people going to say but like I said earlier if I stopped and tried to cover all bases I wouldn't get anything done half as quickly as I do and I'd probably the story would be all the poorer for it I think you can aim to do as much as you can um, with the talents you have and hope that someone else will be along and will be allowed the space to come along and hit the points that you couldn't quite reach just as long as the stories are, are different enough from one another you know as long as there's a variety i think yeah absolutely mm. yeah i really liked what you wrote on sort of um acting and gay casting which it was, was very long guyliner.com yeah <laughs> yes on the guyliner.com that's right yeah. promo yeah um but yeah um, i i think the story the magnificent sons it is diverse and it is um really in a nice way it highlights like by issues and the discrimination there doesn't it and um there's a bit about it with including trans with with kia um yeah and all and all there for a reason so you see you know kia is you know trick is it is a young gay guy and it's he just would in his circle have you know people with diverse genders and sexualities that that because he's young and he lives in london and he goes you know, to a certain type of school and lives in a certain area and socialise in certain places, he's going to have that variety uh, around him. Whereas Jake, who has been ostensibly straight for nearly 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, and went to a different school and, you know, has a very different background and his job is quite a, a straight, you know, environment. He won't have different people like that around him. So it shows then that, you know, the glaring differences between experiences. He doesn't have that safety net of you know gay or bi or trans friends who can keep him in check or offer advice he makes them eventually obviously when he comes out but yeah. until then he's got nobody really apart from the men he's had brief contact with yeah I mean I in the book I sort of related to Jake a bit just how because because I came out quite late really as the, mm. the 20 the like yeah the 2010s I guess um but um I can yeah kind of related to his like vanilla approach and sort of not wanting to share his otherness and his difference um yeah and for all his you know he still saw the world in a very binary way mm. he doesn't really understand um his own bisexuality really yeah. uh, he has a girlfriend as well which is a quite an important plot point you know when the book begins he has a, a long-term girlfriend and the book is quite it's, she is also the, the third main character, I would say, in how she deals with her boyfriend, uh, telling her he's bi. Um, but he's always looked at the he's always looked at it in a very extreme way as oh, you know, I just I have to be straight or gay, so I'll be straight, mm -hmm. and I'll ignore the other part of me because I don't really understand what it is, which is a consideration for so many people. Yeah, yeah. It does, yeah, I saw that in the book, how he was trying to hide his, like, feminine side or, mm. you know, things. And um... It's quite interesting, I think, how the gay, a lot of the gay characters in the book see Jake as straight acting and mm. masculine and very privileged, etc. in that regard. And yet the straight characters, you know, one of the characters says to him, oh, you know, we all, they all called you puff behind your back. Did you know? You know, the, and he, you know, saw him as more effeminate. It's, you know, it's kind of you, you are different things to different people, no matter how much you try and self edit, which is something that Jake does a lot. Mm -hmm. There are just elements of yourself that you can't hide, and people will see the bits of you that they want to see. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and um, yeah, particularly I find like femme shame, shame in, the, in like the gay community quite annoying because to me like like tricks like fabulousness might fall into like makeup and feminine attributes and I don't think that should be weird any differently to masculinity and it, it's just a shame that some people are more well yeah not very really inclusive of, of it it's it's interesting with trick because his femininity is never really presented as anything weird until it is until someone else, you know, comments on it quite late in the book, it transpires that, you know, uh, in fact, it's Jake who has a problem with it, Jake who feels uncomfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene later in the book where we flash back to 
an interaction between Jake and Trick when Trick is about six or seven years old. And, you know, Trick is wearing fairy wings and eyeshadow and he's about to go out into the street where there is a bully lurking and Jake knows there's a bully there. And Jake says, you know, why don't you just try and keep that too in the house, you know, where we understand you and everything and so that nobody else can see. And Trick says to him, which is one of my favorite lines Trick says, and he has many zingers. He just says, I want them to see. Because he that's what that's what he is about. He's about performing. He, he, he doesn't really subscribe to anyone else's prejudices of him. But he does say later in the book that he knows what people say about him. He's not immune to it, you know, and it is upsetting. But he chooses, it takes everything in him, but he chooses to just carry on. He doesn't want to do what his brother did, which is hide part of himself away. Mm. There's no right or wrong in it, is there, in, in you choosing to express your masculinity or femininity in any way you choose. But there are, but like I was saying, there are bits of it that you just can't hide. You know, I'm I'm aware of my own mannerisms. I'm aware of what my voice sounds like and how that can appear. And it attracts attention sometimes, unwarranted, bad attention that I don't want. And I just have to live with it. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. And sometimes it will just be a case of walking down the street in a red jumper and someone will call out, uh, you know, a, a homophobic slur. And it's happened like two weeks ago to me. So, you know, it's just something you have to deal with. It's not even always about, you know, hiding who you are. Sometimes it's all out there for all to see. They, sometimes they just, they can just grab it out of you if they want. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's a shame that within the community, we waste so much time doing the homophobes or the transphobes or the biphobes work for them. Um, I wish that would stop. I, I, but you know, we've got a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, okay. We will argue, and that, that's that's our right as well, I suppose, to to have a good argument about something. Yeah, yeah, because um, and I remember the part in the book where I think Jake meets up with his um, an old friend and. Um, sort of recoils at his nail varnish and um yes evan isn't it it's the guy uh not a spoiler because it's in the fir very first part of the book where he kisses when he's when he's 17 and they meet up years later and evan is uh yeah comfortable in his uh sexuality and his uh gender expression i suppose you would say yeah yeah definitely yeah and yeah jake is, is his in he's not out yet so his internalized homophobia is still dominant there mm. yeah um and another sort of um what we sort of touched on previously is ageism in the book there's a nice character Bertie isn't it who's mm -hmm. older character sort of a bit of an advisor to Jake um yeah I um you know I'm I'm an older gay man and I know even older gay men and I remember being younger and you know spending time with these older gay men and their advice that they would give to me that I would ignore and you know it's I wanted to have an older character in there um just to represent the different experiences again and the different paths to uh working out your own stuff I suppose I remember reading I'd already written most of the book and I read a piece by somebody about the tropes you will find in, a, in gay novels and one of them was oh there's always this older guy who like totally isn't interested sexually in any of the characters but he's just there being motherly and has no ulterior motives at all and I thought brilliant he's definitely staying in then um you know it was quite a a, a derisory piece but I thought well you know these men do exist and it's never really made clear whether Bertie is sexually interested in Jake or not. He says he isn't, but we don't know that for sure. Um, yeah. It was important for me to have him in there because there is a lot of ageism uh, out there in every, you know, walk of life, not just the LGBTQ scene and especially against, you know, women in particular. So I just, I wanted some representation in there, I suppose, but he, so he, again, he serves a purpose in just the contrast of experiences that between him and Jake really, and also, you know, other characters that come into that, um, that arena that they, you know, that world that they share. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think like, um, you know, it's, we have friends of all ages, don't we? And, you know, um, it doesn't mean, 
you know, you're going to have relationships with most of them. It might, you know, mostly your friends are your friends, aren't they? You know? Um, yeah. I, I mean, when I first came out, a lot of the people I met were through things like work or clubbing. So I went out a lot when I first came out and, um, you know, they, they weren't all the same age as me or the same life stage of me. And some of them were straight or whatever. And, you know, you just, you do meet different people. It's not, it's not ghettoized. Maybe it is a little if when you're meeting people on apps and you're switching off those the toggles that you know don't want to meet anyone over 25, that kind of thing. But when you are out meeting people in real life, uh, you you will meet all kinds of people, all ages, all all backgrounds. Did you? I don't know if we mentioned this before. Did you have a favourite character from the book? Uh, I think I've been asked this before and I can't remember what I said. Uh, Favourite to write was Trick and Kia and his group. Trick, Kia and Hot Will, I think, just because it was like writing science fiction for me, writing and writing in the, being in the heads of teenagers. It was honestly like sci-fi. I mean, I was like, God. And he, I could go places with it because, you know, there's an element to Trick where he is supposed to be kind of ridiculous and over the top. Um, and, you know, he isn't necessarily there to be relatable on the surface of it, but some of his things he goes through are, and I think I could just, he could just say, say the things that might might make you go, wow, or whatever. So he was, he was fun to write. Uh, Amelia, possibly my favorite character, just because I really found exploring her, uh, life before and after. Jake, really interesting to, to write. And um, I think she is a good character. And I was really, um, you know, as a, as a man writing a female character, I, you know, I know what everybody says about men writing women and how bad it always is. I wanted to try and do justice to all the women I know and write a really good women, woman character. And I hope I pulled that off. Yeah. No, yeah. no women I know have complained. Yeah. So that's a good sign. Her journey was like carried on and it, it wasn't that she was just tossed aside. With, exactly. Know. That was really important to me. And it, it's, you know, very much about her as well as the two men. Yeah. Um, so in the book, um, there are some more sort of like erotic and saucy scenes. Um, I know there's one quite near the beginning of the book with a work colleague in Cologne that made me cringe a little bit. <laughs> um, how cringe do you, how? Um, <laughs> well, just with it being a work colleague as well, but um, yeah, how do you find sort of writing erotic and saucy scenes in the book? Uh, it's embarrassing. It's difficult. It's difficult. I, I sex is hard to write well, I think. And it's I, whenever I'm reading a sex scene in a book, I'm always a bit like, mm. so because I knew it was going to be difficult. So I decided to make it as ridiculous and funny as I could. So like you say, it's cringe. The I don't think it's a spoiler to say that Jake goes uh, on a work trip and has a mutual masturbation session with a with a, a straight colleague. Um, so I decide, and it's relevant to the plot. It's, you know, I think sex scenes for the sake of it, they don't fascinate me in a book any more than a scene of someone going for a poo would, you know, it's use your imagination. If you really want to imagine these characters doing it, unless it's developing the character or moving the story along in some way, or have something to say about sex and sexuality in general, there'd be no point. The sex scenes in this, the, in this book in the Magnificent Sons all play a part. So that scene in Cologne is Jake, you know, he's starting to think about his own sexuality there. He has a crush on this colleague as well, which really intensifies after this experience, but the crush doesn't mention it ever again. And it's kind of that, the, the crushing feeling of having a crush, I suppose. And you think you're making progress and you have this experience together and then it's just shut down entirely um and the other sex scenes for the same reason they show uh, a development in whichever character is involved in them at the time they they have a story to tell 
but yeah, writing them is difficult. And so I stayed rather than say anything like, you know, throbbing members and magic wands or anything like that. And, you know, cavernous love orifices whatever you see this is why i don't write like that uh, i kept it all in the character's head and what they're feeling um and the how, how it yeah how it feels for them and what it means to them that this that the sex is happening rather than the actual mechanics of in out in out because you can imagine you know yeah, unless, unless the, the character is they're basically seeing it through the character's eyes and how they, they are feeling and everything about that moment and what it means to them rather than uh, just writing a romanticized version of a biology textbook. No offense to anyone who writes those because there are a lot of readers who like to explore the, uh, <laughs> the, the uh, yeah, that that way, that yeah. <laughs> I can't think of a way to describe it. But yeah, there are there are readers who like to see it going in and out, and that's that's fine. But you probably won't find that in my one of my books. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah. Never say never, but at the moment, no. Yeah, I think that first one caught me by surprise a little bit, but then other than that, I, yeah, I agree. I think um, they were part of the story. That was the hardest one to write, mm. definitely. I wasn't sure whether to say what was actually, you know, be how explicit to be about what was happening. It was the power of suggestion, I think, was better. You know, there's the image of the pyjama, <laughs> pyjama bottoms coming off. I was writing it going, <laughs> but it had to be done. So, so um, we, well, we've covered a lot really, haven't we? Um, mm. Yeah, I also really liked, I think, that like the book being a happy ending. Um, if that's not too much of a spoiler. Um, I think in there, um, there's a bit about honest communication, which is sort of demonstrated well in the book. Um, and um, yeah, it's quite an ambitious story. So we, we, was it sort of intentional to be so ambitious? You feel it's a happy ending. Uh, it's not sad, I suppose. Yeah. It's, a hope, it's hopeful maybe. Yeah, I, it's it's um, it's left quite open. Yeah, without giving spoilers away, I suppose. Yeah, it's it's a it's a hopeful ending. There's still a lot to do. It's it feels like there's it's definitely not all over, and there's definitely not a happily ever after. But yeah, there's more to do, and yeah, I'm happy with that last chapter and, and who it's focused on and what happens next. However, yes, um, ambitious. Yes. Um, did I intend to be so ambitious? Yes and no. I didn't, I don't suppose I thought when I started it just how ambitious it was going to be. And there was a point when I was in it, writing it, when I thought, oh, shit, I am trying to do a lot. <laughs> there is a lot here. Um, can I do it all? And, and can I do it all justice? I'm not sure. Um, but but yeah, I, I, I like I said, I had a lot I wanted to cover intergenerational stuff, different experiences, depending on gender and sexuality and your relationship. Like, for example, you know, the two guys are brothers, but they have completely different and they have the same family, but they have completely different experiences growing up and different, completely different reactions to coming out. So, um, yeah, there was a lot I wanted to cover. So I suppose it was intentional that it was ambitious. I wasn't expecting it to be easy I knew it was going to be a challenge and I think maybe it was a bit of a you know a, a shift after the first book maybe it's not what people were expecting from me um, but at the same time it has quite a lot of the same sensibilities as the last Romeo it has the same you know it, it is funny I mean it probably doesn't come across in the way we've spoken about the book but it is actually funny it's just quite heavy the, the, the subject matter is heavy but it is funny there are, there are jokes in it and one-liners and kind of good characters who you know run run off a few zingers and stuff um that was maybe one of the trickier parts about it was keeping it light even though it's about heavy subject matters I suppose 
yeah that that was the most ambitious thing about it was because life is not all miserable and even in your darkest hour there will be some humor to be mined from it in some way or another weren't there so mm. that's what I was going for with it ambitious yes whether I uh fulfilled the ambition I don't know I can't answer that question that would be a reader uh, to answer for me um I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out yeah I don't, I don't think I'd do much of it differently if I did it again yeah I really enjoyed it and as well it's a length of book I like as well not too like you know not um, too many pages so it's a good no, I think it's 90,000 words which is more than enough yeah um, yeah and I had a few chuckles as well reading it so oh good that's good <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, we can just to wrap up, what are your sort of goals and things happening for the future? Well, um, obviously, hopefully The Last Romeo will go into production on, on TV. That would be amazing uh, to see that happen. Um, just yeah, TV takes ages. So you're just waiting to see now what's going to happen. So if it gets commissioned, it will be on the TV, which would be fabulous. Um, I've just finished my third novel uh, called The Fake Up. I got a new book deal, uh, which is really exciting for two more books. So the third one is out next year. Um, so obviously my goals for that are, I hope it sells lots of copies and people enjoy it. Um, and there are gay characters in there, which is great. And then I'll write another one. <laughs> um, but my goals really, I suppose, are as an author to just carry on telling different stories different stories that i can make funny in some way or ridiculous fun fun and ridiculousness are my two aims but have a point that have a point to them as well that are saying something there's nothing wrong with writing novels or making content that is frivolous and fun and i hope i do that anyway but um if there are any kind of messages i can get out there kind of stealthily under the under the radar, then I'm I'm happy to do that as well. I suppose my main goal is just to carry on inhibiting the space that I have and offer it up to as many other people as I can and, and ensure that as many people as possible are getting their say out there and being able to tell their stories in some way. I'm just happy to be part of it all really. Yeah, fabulous. Yeah. Well, I look forward to your next few books. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks for joining us. No worries. I'm just ashamed. It's just a shame that it's not uh, in person. And I do hope for the next one, when we're all back in rooms, that I can be there. It'd be amazing. Yes. Yeah, absolutely.